Well, I must say first that uh, it was one of the most beautiful lectures I heard about uh, the advantages of uh, genetically modified organisms. <clears throat> I heard some lectures by biologists in previous times, but I must say that yours was <coughs> far more convincing. And when I prepared this uh, comment, my idea was, oh, if one day you are suffering from unemployment, may, uh, you will be immediately recruited by Monsanto. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I heard later that, in fact, you have already connections. <laughs> but the uh, second problem, I think, is that it's very difficult to comment because you really you have a huge expertise in this field. And when you are, I am a biologist, but not an expert in uh, uh, genetically modified organism. I am also uh, interested by history and philosophy of science, but, well, it's difficult to really argue uh, against you. So I will not do that, but more maybe do comment or extend your talk in <coughs> directions you have not really addressed, but more philosophical maybe issues and uh, issues at the boundary between uh, what you described and other wider fields. So I will focus on two points. The first is organic agriculture or farming. And uh, I was somehow surprised that you did not give a definition of what is organic farming, organic agriculture, because I think personally, for me, it's not obvious <coughs> to have a definition. I think in addition, that is probably diverse, different from one country to another, one continent from another. You know that in France, we have another expression. It's not organic farming or organic agriculture. It's biological agriculture. And I always personally wondered what might be an agriculture who would not be biological. So <laughs> that's a problem. And uh, from your lecture, I had the feeling that uh, you were telling that somehow organic farming is the form of farming which was existing, let's say, one or two centuries ago. Or at least it's the efforts to somehow reconstitute this form of farming, but keeping progresses which were done since, for instance, new crops, and, and also maybe avoiding some of the defects which has been clearly revealed by the recent development in agriculture. So it would be a kind of mixing, somehow return towards the past, somehow, but keeping progresses which have been done and uh, since uh, during the last two centuries, and in addition, avoiding some of really the problems that we see, for instance, the treatment of animals, the way they are suffered, and so on. So it's kind of mixed attempt to make agriculture slightly different. But maybe uh, later you can comment and come back on this. I think, for me, it's not so much clear at this point so far. And the second question about organic farming is a point you raised. Uh, the percentage of organic farming is not increasing, despite some efforts, even from the governments, to increase the population. And why? Why is organic farming not developing more. You say the yields are not maybe optimal, but since you have these subsidies, one might think that it's not a serious problem. So are there other reasons why organic farming is not uh, developing faster? So it was my first question about organic farming <coughs> compared to other forms of agriculture. And the second point was on uh, more genetically modified organisms, plant crops. And uh, first you say, and I personally fully agree, that uh, the, it's not a problem of being natural or not natural. And I think it's for organic farming, but also for genetically modified crops. And it's not a good question, or at least it's another question, uh, but a very difficult and uh, probably a question is more, uh, it's not the best to enter into it. So there is another question, more modest, I think, is, is this way to produce crops different from the traditional ways to produce crops? 
So it's not a question of being natural or not, but different. And uh, if you look at the discussions which uh, were, uh, which somehow took place about a genetically modified organism, I think the first focus was on, on the nature of the variations. And uh, somehow if we consider since Darwin that transformation occurs by variation and selection, uh, we can ask a question, what is new? Is it in the uh, modification process or is it in the selection process? And I think most of the discussion focused on the modification process. Introducing DNA into a plant is something which is very different from what happens before. But uh, now that variation mutation are best known, I think, and it has been discovered that in fact what this unique word mutation covers very different processes including uh, transfer of full DNA molecule from one organism to the other. So, in fact, uh, introduced DNA as it is done today is not different from what occurs in, uh, between organisms. So from the point of view of variations, I think it's clear that now there is no difference. There is a difference only if one considers that there is no DNA in the crops, which apparently is a common opinion in the population. More than 50 people think that there is no DNA in crops and vegetables. So in this case, obviously, it's something very different. But otherwise, I think the variation are not different. But now let's turn maybe to the second part of the process of transformation, which is selection. And in fact, selection, it's not natural selection. But it's not different from the selection of plant crops which have been done during centuries. It's an artificial selection, uh, which was distinguished by uh, Darwin from natural selection. So there is also not a difference in uh, selection, not in variation, not in selection. But maybe not a qualitative difference. But maybe there is a quantitative difference. And in particular, selection with this new way to producing crops, you have two different things. The first is the fact that it will be more centralized. You will have production of a li very limited number of uh, crops, plants. You mentioned this point already, the decrease in uh, genetic uh, uh, richness in the number of gene genetic pool. But I think one possibility would be the disappearance of natural genes uh, allowing resistance to disease. And if you have too much concentration, independently of the loss of many genes, the risk is to have a, a new crop which would be sensitive to a new virus, for instance, and in this case there will be no resistance. So maybe with uh, genet this new process of producing crops, you have, <coughs> you have somehow a leap in the, let's say, in the decrease of the genetic pool, which was not existing before. And the second point is the rhythm of variation. Because I think even selection of crops as it existed in the past century was a very long process. And now you have a selection which takes artificial selection in a few months. And my question is, is not such uh, the result different from this two variation. In the fact that you have more folk concentration on one uh, plant and you have also a faster rhythm of variation. So is not maybe it's a difference, not qualitative not qualitative difference, but the quantitative difference that uh, must be taken into account. So well these were my two comments. Thank you very much. Our second speaker will be Professor Jean Caillon, also from the IHPST in Paris. Uh, thank you, John. Uh, <coughs> uh, Paul, just as Michel as was, uh, I was uh, astounded by your, by, by, by your talk, which was absolutely superb, and which has people thinking differently, because the well, majority of people speaking of uh, GMOs and Monsanto and the likes uh, do not go 
in the direction that you have chosen. So I think he needs this needs this needs some courage and uh, the amount of information, ideas, arguments that you've got that is is is, is just marvelous. And there is even more in your book published at Cambridge University Press, uh, which I take as a sort of Bible. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't mean that um, I agree with, the, with all arguments, but uh, you know, I know of no book so, so well done on the subject. Okay, now I have um, five minutes, five questions, brief but big questions. My questions are open except for two that will, will involve some uh, some iron. Uh, five questions, scientific, technical, economic, ethical, and political. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, have to, I have to find something to tell just to attract attention even if there is nothing else. So, <laughs> so uh, scientific. Scientific, well, GMOs are based on a very particular class of uh, geni genetic phenomena. They are based, well, in the present state, on genes that alone, or perhaps with one, one or two of the genes, produce a massive effect. Uh, thus, we are in a situation uh, similar to medical genetics, where you may have diseases that are um, almost univocally produced by one mutation. This exists, but it's extremely rare. The common situation in genetics is networks, epigenetics, complexity, and even when you have one <coughs> gene that does something of a generation, the network will maybe just uh, change everything. So, so my, my first question is scientific. So GMOs, GMOs uh, produce marvelous, uh, no, marvelous, well, impressive, uh, technical effect, but I'm not sure that the kind of science it's based on will have um, um, uh, a, a future yeah, that will. Uh, I, I don't think that uh, it, it's so much promising for the uh, for the future. My second question is technical. It's related to to, to, to the last one, but it takes us a little closer to. Uh, to politics and, 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 and in the sense of policy of research. Um, I did this, um, this objection from uh, uh, a number of, um, of people, like mainly uh, agricultural scientists, geneticists, and evolutionists. Leontin as is one of these. And the argument consists in saying that uh, for a century, since, since 1920, um, the, the biggest amount of research for, um, in favor of, uh, for, for genetic improvement has been based on hybridization and now on GMOs. And they say, well, um, a lot of money has been invested in this area by private company, by uh, national agencies, etc. Uh, uh, et okay. Uh, and it has produced effect, of course. Uh, but are we sure that we might not have been able to attain the same goals or similar goals um, with, um, um, with <coughs> procedures based on artificial selection? And well, well probably yes. But. Um, the economic effect is, is not the same because, uh, <coughs> you know, uh, hybridization and GMOs are something quite, in, uh, quite, quite important for uh, capitalistic companies uh, that want to keep control of, uh, of what they obtain. Whereas if you obtain it for selection, I'm not sure that it would be so easily controlled. But of course, in these research programs, there is also always a mixture of hybridization uh, of gene and, and of selection, but I think well, for, for a century it has it, it has gone in one direction, and, and so that's that's my second question. Uh, my third question is uh, economic. Uh, um, at a certain point in, in your exposition, you say that uh, you were 
you, you, you spoke about the con concentration, I thought, the concentration of control <laughs> of the seed production, and I would also say, and use. You say production and distribution, and I would say production and use. And this is related to something that has been extremely popular among anti-GMO, anti-GMO agriculture. You said, I do worry about this. You began like this. I do worry about this. And then you, you told a story. Well, I'm glad to, to buy the seeds for my potatoes. And uh, what, where, what, what's the problem? Well, the problem is, you know, it's a little, and you said, well, we must have a wider picture. OK, there have been some little scandals, but look at the wide, uh, at the wide picture. And I will tell you what. Look at Dominic Strauss-Kahn, excellent economist, excellent director of the International Monetary Fund. It is just for a small sexual job. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, <laughs> uh, extrapolate to Monsanto, and you, you understand what I mean. Uh, when, when, when a company begins suing uh, someone who accidentally got the seed in his garden, did not buy it, doesn't want it, and he sued. Well, but, you know, this is the kind of thing that can socially kill a certain, a certain program. So I would like to know about your potatoes and Monsanto. <laughs> Ethical, that, that's a, a huge issue, and I know that you are very much concerned about it. And it's a question that comes naturally from your, uh, from your talk, but you did not raise it, or, or obliquely. You said, well, we have a problem with demography for two centuries since the uh, agriculturist revolution. So uh, finally, <coughs> Marcus was wrong, and we are, be, we are getting more and more numerous. And uh, how can, can we feed all these people? And GMOs may be a, a decent solution. Well, OK, but I would like, if, what, if, if you're allowed to say a word, a single word, I would like to have your position on demography. You know, of course, we must feed all these people. but. Uh, uh, is, is it uh, so sacred, so dangerous that uh, we cannot speak about it if, if, if this is a problem? And my last question is, um, oh, that's a provocation, it's, it's more political. So, uh, the spirit of your talk and its marvelous argumentation is, well, you know, you look at the argument, there is no problem. There is a, on the whole, well, we have a problem, there are good solutions, some, some little problems, there is no problem. But my problem is, well, why are there millions of, bill no, maybe not billions, but hundred millions of people saying, we don't want it, and my question is, why? You, speak, you spoke about medicine and food, there was something interesting there. So, so, so I, I suggest that the problem may be not only a scientific and technical problem, Maybe, maybe elsewhere, and if you can say something about this uh, in a future book, I, I will be there. Thank you very much. <laughs> Michael, uh, Professor Michael Winter next uh, from the Exeter Centre for Law Research. Thank you very much, John. Yes, I'm, we've had two uh, interventions that are very much focused on, on the GM issue, but your paper was much broader than that. Uh, I also enjoyed it enormously. Um, but I want to suggest that your, your, your uh, self-professed uh, profession of, of, of pluralism, that you perhaps weren't pluralist enough. Uh, and uh, I want to start with your identification of the problem in the first place. Because you started by saying that it was very much uh, around um, uh, two crucial factors of population growth and increasing efforts. And I would suggest that there are some other crucial factors that lead actually to more pluralist solutions than just GM or organic. And I know you weren't saying it's just GM or organic. Climate change is clearly one of them. Uh, that under, uh, um, underlies a lot, a, a lot of the, the direction of change that we'll need in agriculture. Fossil fuel dependency is clearly another. And fossil fuel dependency, particularly in, in the kind of agriculture you're talking about, is, is very great indeed. Um, I think also that once you sort of accept that the, the problem is much broader than just those two, you begin to think of sort of more pluralist solutions. So let's look at one or two of the, the factors that you didn't mention in that identification of the problem beyond those two of climate change and fossil fuel dependency. One of them is the, if we have an increased population to feed <coughs> of, of maybe nine, nine billion, um, we have to look at waste, for example, in, in the food system. 
uh, reckon to be 30, 30%, 40% maybe, uh, different parts of the world for very different reasons so along the whole of the food chain. I think we also have to look at what lies, you didn't, I suppose you didn't mention it, I, I, I'm sure you're, you're more than well aware of it, but what lies behind the issue of increasing affluence is the so-called nutrition transition. In, I mean, you obviously kind of obliquely referred to it in talking about meat, and people in, eating more meat uh, and dairy products and various other things as, as they get more affluent. That clearly increases the, the land take and the requirement for land, and requirement for the kind of crops that, that feed those, those animals. I don't think, whilst I wouldn't go with the uh, Soil Association in this country that has just said, oh, we don't take any notice of the nutrition transition, we just want people to eat, eat sensibly, you know, people will eat what they will eat. But I do think we need to challenge the, the way our diet is going. And that's our, this is the, this pluralist uh, kind of set of solutions I think we're looking for. So waste, tackling waste would be one. Tackling dietary change would be another. I think also um, looking at non-conventional uh, food crops, uh, particularly uh, around perennials, or around algae, around fish. You mentioned fish in passing, but I think there's some very, we've had a very, very bad uh, track record in terms of, uh, of farming fish, both marine and, and freshwater, but I think there are ways of in, in, improving that. Again, it's part of the pluralist uh, solution. So I think, and, and, and another big issue is, is op, op competing land uses. So in other words, what I'm saying is the problem actually I think is bigger than you set out. If it was only, if it was only uh, population and increasing affluence, I think it would be quite tackable, e you know, easy to tackle even within conventional plant breeding. It's because it's all these other things I think it is so challenging. So competing land uses for biofuels uh, and so on and so forth as well. So I think it's in that context, I'm actually with you quite a bit of the way in terms of, of being sympathetic to GM as part of the solution. Incidentally, I don't think that GM uh, is necessarily complete, and I think you alluded to this, completely uh, at the opposite end of the spectrum to organic. And in fact, if you talk to organic farmers as opposed to their uh, self-elected spokesman, uh, they're quite often quite sympathetic to, to, to good organic, uh, good GM kind of development. So I think there's some interesting issues there. I want to defend organic a little bit though, because I've had a lot, I've got a, I had a lot of uh, uh, time for organics in, in many ways. One thing I think we were a little bit naughty, you seemed to conflate, you knew what you were doing, you conflated the livestock industry and all the attendant problems of livestock with organics. Now, come on, <laughs> you know, if, if only one or two percent of, of our food production is organic, then only one or two percent of livestock production is organic. So I think that was, that was, that was a little mischievous. And, and, and the problem of, of livestock, I mean, you're, you're right, it is a huge problem. I think, again, you're, you're, we need to look for solutions to some of that, unless we're going to assume people aren't going, to, aren't, aren't going to eat meat. I want to reduce meat consumption, but I don't think it's going to go away. It actually, uh, and this is very much a kind of Western European point, it has a very important role, I think, in our, in our part. Come out with me, you're probably, you're probably doing other things tomorrow, but come to West Devon. Uh, where I live and, and see how wet it is. It grows grass. It probably would grow trees very well as well, so maybe there's some interesting issues there, but it grows grass. And, and I don't like eating grass. Uh, <laughs> you know, it's best if it's, if it's turned in, 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 into, into animal flesh, along, along with other things. And actually some of our most prized biodiversity, certainly in this country, and you're absolutely right, I mean, there's, there's nothing natural in terms of any of the prized environments that we have. Some of our most pri prized uh, biodiversity in Western Europe is, is, is dependent on livestock grazing. Uh, and I don't think it's, in, I mean, I, I don't think it's entirely to do to, just, to suggest that, I don't think you were, but I, I, it's sort of like here that agriculture somehow is an automatic kind of, you know, biodiver direct relationship between biodiversity and agriculture intensity. I mean, there, there's certain types of agriculture actually increase biodiversity. I mean, certainly great, you know, what would you prefer, a mono a mono crop of, of, of beech trees on chalk, on chalk or the sort of floristically rich chalk, grazed chalk downland, grazed by sheep? I mean, so there are some, in other words, you can eat biodiversity uh, you, but by eating meat. So there's some, there's some positive land use implications of livestock, but, but much reduced consumption, I, I, I would say. Uh, I think of one or two, I, I'm finishing it, John, I'm probably going on far too much. <laughs> So I, I, I do think this critique of livestock uh, farming conflated with organic is, is, is naughty. I also think that, that um, the, the greenhouse gas issue and, and livestock has hit us very, very fast. Really, four or five years ago, 
I think we have to invest some research time and effort into that, and, and certainly there's a lot of research going on looking at diets of animals in, in an effort to, to, to reduce that. I also think we have to invest a lot of research, and quite a bit is going on, on what we do with that, that livestock waste. Uh, it, it doesn't automatically always end up in, in the waterways. I mean, if you compost it, it's got a much better chance of staying in the right place in the soil. If you actually anaerobically digest it and just use the digestate, you've got better control. So there, is, there, there are some smart solutions to some of, the, some of these issues, which I think uh, need to be recognised. I think also, as far as organic goes, and, and quite a few of these other uh, possible solutions, perennial crops, for example, we've not made the investment in research and development that we have in more conventional agriculture. There's been a, you actually you go to places like Rothamsted, which I know well, and, and various other agricultural research institutes in this country, you see very, very little research going on on organic systems. Uh, and I, I think that, that's a danger. So I think all I'm really saying, uh, by way of conclusion, is great, I enjoyed it, I'm kind of absolutely up there for the, for the GM debate. I think I, you know, I'm in favour of GM in, in, in certain ways, in certain contexts. But I think it's got to be part of, a, of an even more plural uh, solution than you alluded to. But you, you know, you didn't have, you didn't have sort of four hours to talk. So uh, <laughs> I'm sure you, uh, you were, would accept some of those points, if not all. Thanks. Thank you. And finally, uh, Dr. Barrett, for minutes. So thanks very much, Paul, for having us along with this way and uh, lay down some rather exposed argument for us all to let uh, sink our teeth into. Um, and thanks to John and Sabina for inviting me to respond. Um, so I've not got anything very substantial to add in 10 minutes, um, just some rather superfluous fluffy thoughts, which will hopefully add to the debate in a second. Um, and I've grouped them under three sets of headings. So uh, firstly, I've got some points to make about history of innovation. Uh, secondly, I've got some points to make about intellectual property and commercialization. And then finally, some points about agricultural systems. And I should also thank the other respondents for having used up all of the good points. <laughs> <laughs> but nevertheless. Um, so, history of innovation. And um, the idea that I want to get across here really could be sloganized, if you like, um, to say why should we always expect the latest technology to be the greatest or the most productive? And this is a point which is very familiar to historians <coughs> of technology. Uh, David Edgerton has a, a nice book which you only really need the title of, it's called The Shock of the Old. Um, and I think we can put some quite specific um, agricultural flesh on for this example um, by pointing to the success of Dutch agriculture. Now um, there's still a great deal of debate about exactly what does or doesn't make Dutch agriculture successful or not. Um, but it's interesting to see what other people point to when they look at this situation. So the uh, USDA's uh, Foreign Agricultural Service produced a grain report in 2005. And uh, what they said was a good geographical location, an excellent infrastructure, and a very professional industry and were the main ingredients for this Dutch situation. Um, and I think infrastructure and professionalism speak to two technologies which are so old we don't really recognize them as being technologies, uh, bureaucracy and extension. Um, but we could also add to this list advances in high pressure sodium lighting, hydroponic culture, or even the types of nutrients that's being used. So, as I said, I didn't want to suggest that I'm providing a definitive answer on Dutch agriculture, but I think it's interesting to point at the very broad range of factors that are highlighted there, and some quite old technologies. And there's a related point we can make about history of technology here. So, we tend to remember the big technological innovations and the inventors responsible for them. Um, but on another view of the history of technology, it's actually the incremental innovations which add the productive force or gains in yields that we need in this sort of situation that Paul's outlined for us. So that's one set of comments. Uh, under history of innovation, why should we expect the latest technology to be the greatest? Or indeed, why shouldn't we expect small incremental innovations to be just as important as the big pin-up innovation moments. So, um, forecasting where innovations will occur is something akin to soothsaying. Um, and there's a huge amount of serendipity in the way in which certain technologies and innovations arrive. 
But of course, we have a legislative system in place to encourage types of innovation, and that's the intellectual property system that we have. Um, <clears throat> so my next set of comments about IP and commercialization, um, and this is really drawing on something that Paul's already mentioned and that John has also mentioned. Um, I think it would be easy to think of Monsanto or Syngenta in the last decade or so but as having been some kind of aberration. Um, and there's actually some nice historical evidence that commercial nurseries and seed breeders have quite frequently been involved in these sorts of activities. So uh, Daniel Kebbles has some nice work on the Stark Brothers nurseries. Uh, the Stark Brothers nurseries were very vocal in calling for the 1930 Plant Patent Act which was the first plant patent act on biological materials. Um, and they also hired the Pinkerton Detective Agency. Um, this was a very unpleasant outfit, which uh, associated with strike breaking and the communist witch hunts in America. And the Stark brothers were hiring them to enforce licenses, which they made their buyers sign at the point of purchase. Um, so it seems there's some evidence that this type of activity is ongoing. Um, and in the contemporary situation, um, certainly, say, Plantum NL, which is the main association of small-scale Dutch plant breeders, have pointed out specifically that they see this shift from plant breeders' rights, which allowed some access for small-scale breeders and farmers, to patents on new varieties as being one of the key problems in the plant breeding sector at the moment. So, on a slightly more sympathetic analysis, of this type of activity. Um, plant breeding is very expensive quite often. You need a lot of land and you need a lot of money. Um, and genetic plant breeding is probably even more expensive. You have to have an appropriate laboratory with appropriate safety procedures in place. Um, so why shouldn't we expect the Monsantos and the Syngentas of the world to be just as creative as they can in trying to recoup as much of that money as possible through the intellectual property system? Well, that's all well and good, but it doesn't make GMO technology and research any cheaper. So, on the one hand, why should we not look to why should we look to the latest technology to be the most important? And secondly, why should we look to the most expensive technologies to be the most important? And here I can gesture in a very facile way to the introduction of the humble turnip into British agriculture. <laughs> Uh, introducing turnips uh, where previously farmers had used a bird of the year for fallow, um, it uh, increased European agricultural production by a third in one fell swoop. Uh, okay, so that's a set of comments under IP and commercialization. Um, finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about agricultural systems, and uh, once again I've been beaten to these comments uh, by Paul, John, and Michael this time. Um, but I think we could bring together um, some of what John and Michael were saying. Um, and obviously, um, Paul wasn't suggesting that there is only GM and there is only organic, and that these two systems are somehow necessarily in competition with each other. Um, and indeed, given the ambiguity over organic certification, the idea of GM organic isn't quite as oxymoronic as it sounds. Um, but rightly or wrongly, um, the biggest obstacle to the introduction of GMOs in Europe, anyway, has been political unpopularity. Um, and that's something we've not mentioned so far today. So if political unpopularity for the purposes of this discussion is off the table, then why don't we look at some really unpopular interventions? And it seems to me, and I think Paul mentioned this, um, the core problem with conventional agriculture is the excessive production and consumption of meat. Um, and I think it might be a little bit wrong-headed to think that instead of addressing this problem, we should be making further technological interventions around the periphery so that we can sustain something which looks very unsustainable. Um, and while, all right, enforced vegetarianism <laughs> might not be possible with any amount of political popularity or goodwill, and I say this jokingly, but there is some precedent for this. In wartime, we have rationing. Yeah. Um, why not let the cost of meat at the point of consumption reflect something like the cost of meat at the point of production? Because the only reason we have this unsustainable production of meat is because it is so heavily subsidized. Why don't we roll back those subsidies? 
Okay, so three comments. Why should we expect the latest thing to be the greatest thing, and the most expensive thing to be the greatest thing? And I think the Smiths already sloganized my third point for me. Uh, meat is murder. Thank you so much. Great. Well, thank you all very much. Um, I just, it's like the impossible situation, because despite your excellent <coughs> timekeeping, which thank you all, um, we have only 20 and a few minutes, and I'm sure you could probably spend twice that answering all the questions that have just come up. So I think what I'll suggest is perhaps if you would like to join the other panelists here um, and, and just maybe take a, a, a really a few minutes to respond to anything that you particularly uh, would um, not want to pass, um, but with us all understanding that you can't really, you couldn't possibly respond to all of the points that we've made. So maybe just some you like to pick out a couple of things that you most like to apply to perhaps open it up to um, do what you Okay. It's <laughs> a tough decision. It is. Um, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, thank you. Great comments. And uh, I don't think there's a huge amount of disagreement uh, on, on almost all of the issues. Um, what it suggests is that this is an incredibly complex landscape. And any kind of slice you take of it try to figure some stuff out is going to be a distortion of the total landscape. So um, let me say, not plural stuff? Well, yeah, quite clearly. Uh, I mean, you are absolutely right. Climate change is coming at us uh, like an incredibly fast locomotive. Uh, fossil fuel dependence, I mean, all, all the things that we just, I think, are part of what we have to consider. And the pluralist just has to stay open to uh, a huge array of potential uh, issues as well as potential solutions. So again, my pluralism would embrace a lot of what you're saying in terms of the potential ways in which you've got to not just go for the flashiest, I would say you said the most expensive and uh, the latest, but just even the flashiest because it seems like uh, you know, a great thing where it's advertised to death. Uh, there are lots of ways in which, with incremental changes, we can make a difference. And this relates both to the population comment as well as the meat comment. We are going to have to do some unpopular things. I mean, it's just plain and simple. We are not going to be able to continue with the kind of political dynamic we have now, where a little bit of squeakiness suddenly means that politicians begin to back off difficult decisions. Population, uh, we are going to have to, as humanely as we can, come to terms with slowing down, if not declining, our population. And I think we have to stop subsidies on meat. It's just as we keep ratcheting up petrol prices in order that um, you can have a sustainable source and you cut down on demand. Every time petrol prices go up in North America, Big cars get sold, and little cars begin to dominate the market. So there really is that kind of effect. Uh, I don't really have time to talk about the difference. Uh, what I think is organic, and what kinds of differences I think. But I think that's an important point. Organic is all over the place. Let me, so any constant, I mean, the meaning is all over. It depends on what country you're in. It depends on which particular region, who's responsible for defining it or certifying it, and I don't have a clean answer for that. It's, it's, a, it's a good question because just using the word means it covers over a multitude of those differences. Uh, so let me spend just the last comment, told not to make, not to respond to everything. Uh, there is one that gets under my skin, and uh, uh, Jean, raised this, and I don't know whether he had in mind the example that occurred in Canada with a farm. But what I suggest, this is this is Percy Schmeiser, who in Canada claims that Monsanto seed blew onto his property, uh, that he was an organic farmer, and that uh, it, it, Monsanto then was suing him for having to grow on his farm. Anybody who wants to know what happened to them, should go to the Supreme Court of Canada website. You should read the uh, depositions of the Supreme Court and the decision of the Supreme Court. He had 1,100 acres planted in straight lines. 
it doesn't blow in. It may have blown in initially <laughs> because it looks as though the, the best story that the court at each level of court went through three court level, the best story they could construct was that uh, some blew in. He figured it might be round up ready. And so he sprayed it with Roundup, and it survived. And so he collected the seeds, and the following year, he deliberately planted them. And that was a patent violation. So Monsanto sued him uh, for this. Whether they should have or not uh, is, is, is a diff different question. But he certainly wasn't just having it blown into his land. And it was set up as a test case. It was like the Scopes trial. Uh, it was set up just to sort of test whether or not patent law on organisms could stand up in Canada, whether or not there could be patent, uh, what, what kind of patent settlements you would get. So it went right to the Supreme Court because of all the issues around patenting, and, and it really was more a test case. So there's lots of stories like that that characterize the industry negatively, that when you dig a little deeper, it turns out aren't quite so simple. So I, I just, because I hear the, the Schmeider story all the time, <laughs> But all the rest of your points, I think, were really good. <laughs> <laughs> Just that one, I wasn't so, so keen. Thanks.